All right, it's kind of a longer chapter here, chapter 17, but um, this one is now dedicated. You know, we've read a lot of different chapters through the books of the kings, and they go into different details of how different kings reigned and ruled and all the different things that happened during those reigns. But chapter 17 is pretty much dedicated to the children of Israel and the northern kingdom being taken captive by the Assyrians and just kind of everything that surrounds that just all wrapped up in this one chapter. And, um, of course, the capital of, of Israel was Samaria at this time, and it's where you hear a lot about Samaria and the Samaritans. And um, I'm going to be tying that in with the New Testament as well a little bit later in this sermon. But um, just the, the, the broad overview, chapter 17 is when God has finally had enough with the wicked kingdom of Israel. Now Judah, the southern kingdom, they're going to be taken captive also later. Um, they, they've got a little bit longer lifespan and, and uh, they've had some more um, goodness to them. They've had more uh, redeeming qualities and, and kings that were good and prophets and, and, and things that have been, uh, the people overall weren't quite as wicked as the people in the northern kingdom, but they also got wicked themselves and, and ultimately God had to bring judgment upon them also. And I mentioned last week how, you know, you read a lot of the, the prophets and the minor prophets as well as the major prophets, this is the time frame now when, when they have kind of begun or they've lived through and were revealing God's word in forms of warning and, and teaching. You know, there's a lot of prophecy. There's, you know, there's a lot to the scripture, obviously. You look at Isaiah. Isaiah was preaching during these times of these kings and <coughs> was giving them some warnings and, and trying to give them the, the advance notice. Hey, this is going to happen. Get right with God. And had the people hearkened unto the Lord, I believe that these things didn't have to happen because God was giving them space to repent, but they decided not to. And we're going to see that here in chapter 17 because they did have opportunities and they just said, nope, we're good the way we are. And, uh, and they weren't good. And God brought his judgment upon them. So let's get, let's get started here. It's kind of a longer chapter. Uh, verse number one, the Bible says, In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, began Hoshea, the son of Elah, to reign in Samaria over Israel nine years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel that were before him. Against him came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, and Hoshea became his servant and gave him presents. So Hoshea was a, a wicked king. He, was, he did not do that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but he said he was a little bit different from the kings that went before him. But Israel's had a string of wicked kings. Just It's just like king after king after king. The last person who was any, like, like remotely good at all was Jehu. That was like the last time, you know, up to, to this point where we are in this, in this history with the kings that they even had someone who was decent, um, you know, that, that were the Bible saying, you know, that, that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And um, they've had many, many people doing that which is evil. And I think, I think more, and, and you'll find this, it's not as much the king that's directing the wickedness of the people. It's more so the people that are wicked, and as a result, they're getting a, a wicked king. I think the people kind of are determining the types of rulers that they're getting. It's not like these kings are going completely against their culture and serving other gods and everything like that. Now, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the first king of Israel after the, the division of the, of the kingdom, he did introduce sin. He did provoke the people to sin and, and, and building the idolatry, building the golden calves and getting people to sin in that way. So, so his sin was kind of more exceeding. That's why he's always being referred back to as, as a, a standard bearer of being a wicked king, of doing that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. Because he actually introduced a lot of evil and, and impacted a lot of people to do evil. Um, but we can see kings, if, you know, the kings can be doing one thing, but if the people were all living righteous and holy and, you know, they were just under this rule, that would be different. God would actually send a deliverer if his people were, were you know, looking to him. So I think, I think more often than not, what you'll see is the king is more reflective of the people. And even some of the good kings, you know, oftentimes I think the people still have been uh, not that good, but the king is kind of able to try to help get things back on track in the right direction. But let's, let's keep going here. I, wanna, I don't want to, you know, take too much time on that. There's a lot of things to cover here. So, um, 
So Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, comes up. Hoshea then, instead of like fighting with him or anything like that, he says, okay, we'll be your servants. And he starts just paying him tribute. He starts giving him money, right? I mean, that, this is the racket. A king comes up against you. He's saying, okay, you're going to be my subjects. You're going to either give me some money or we're going to go to war and I'm going to take you over and, and, you know, take over your land and everything else. So he starts paying him off. And then he says he gave him presents. Verse 4, it says, And the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and brought no present to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. So he stops paying his tribute to the king of Assyria, and, and he finds out, actually, he's been paying money to the king of Egypt instead of the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria didn't like that, so he comes and, and arrests him and puts him in prison. <coughs> and that's been kind of the way that the children of Israel have dealt with their problems, is relying on these other wicked nations to support them. That's who they're relying on. They're trusting in the world. Instead of turning to God, you know, the, the, whenever they're, bring, they're brought affliction, some people are coming against them, and there's, you know, a potential battle or whatever, the proper response would be trust in the Lord. That's what God has said over and over again. That's what the prophets are all telling them to do. Hey, trust in God. Trust in the Lord. Get rid of these idols. Get rid of these false gods. Get right with God and God will defend you. God will protect you. God will be there for you. But no, they're always just trying to rely on the world, trying to rely on Egypt. And, you know, like I said, this is the culmination of, of, of a lot of uh, wickedness in the land of Israel. Let's keep reading. Verse number five. Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria, the, excuse me, in the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hela and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. So he's finally, he besieges Samaria, the capital city. After three years, they give up. He, he's basically conquered them, he takes over, and now he's leading the people captive out of the land. Uh, verse number seven. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. Now look, it just got done saying what the king of Assyria had done and, and what the king of Israel had done, and now it's ascribing this judgment upon them to God. It's basically saying that, yeah, these things all happened. This is the way it played out. But ultimately, the reason why the Assyrians came and they besieged Israel and all this stuff was happening to them is because the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which is what verse 7 is explaining. For so it was, the children of Israel sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt. God delivered them out of Egypt. He took them out of bondage. He gave them their own land. He gave them instructions to live by. And it says, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods and walked in the statutes of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel which they had made so they had a great deliverer the Lord who gave them good judgment good good uh, rules good uh, laws and they rejected God and they even turned to the gods that couldn't protect the people of the land of which God gave them that land you know, the, all the false gods, the, 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 the people that should have been destroyed. And I went into that a little bit last week. They left them alive. They learned to, their gods and decided to worship and trust in their gods instead of the Lord that actually delivered them from Egypt. And it says in verse 9, And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities from the tower of the watchman to the fence city. Now, if you've been paying attention to all these Bible studies we've been doing week after week, what do we see every week? They still have the high places. They still have the high, even the kings that are doing right in Judah, they still have the high places. It's just the high places are set up and they continue to use these high places to worship the false gods. Or even if they're worshiping the Lord, that's not something God established was to, to build these high places. No, that's what the heathen do. You don't worship the Lord the same way that the heathen worship their false gods. You do things God's way. And, and this is something that really, really angers God is when you don't listen to him, when you don't hearken, you, just, you can't just accept his word for what he says. And people are always trying to do something else and merge 
other people's gods and religions with the Lord. And it makes God angry. We see here, they built them high places, verse 10, and they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them, and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. Now, in these past few verses, what are all the references coming up that's getting God so angry? It's the idolatry. It's the false gods. And this is when God has had enough. God has been very... I mean, you read these chapters and you look at the wicked kings and you look at the wickedness being done in the land of Israel and you can see the long-suffering of God. You could see him bringing judgment. You could see other people coming. But you see, <coughs> excuse me, how long God has let things go to get to this point of, uh, you know, finally just letting them completely be taken captive out of the land. And God just says, I'm done protecting you. And I'm done, you know, sending you the warnings. Well, I'm done with you completely. And what he references here in 2 Kings 17, what we're told the most about is that the reason why they're taking God is because of their idolatry, because they basically rejected the Lord, which you have to reject the Lord if you're going to just go and worship false gods, if you're going to go and, and, and start just, just being idolatrous and worshiping these other false gods. Now, this is something that we need to take heed to because it is found all throughout Scripture. Turn, if you would, real quick to Deuteronomy 5. We'll look at the Ten Commandments real quick. Obviously, there are more commandments that God has given through his law. We go over this out soul winning and stuff too, but people are familiar with the Ten Commandments. But there are these Ten Commandments that are known as the Ten Commandments, and they're known in Scripture as the Ten Commandments. These are very important laws to God. They are set apart from the rest of all of the other laws that God has given through Moses and through other prophets. But these are specifically very important laws. And he starts off, look at verse number 6 of Deuteronomy 5. He says, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. He's identifying himself, who he is. I'm your redeemer. I'm the deliverer. I brought you up out of Egypt. I'm the Lord your God. Verse 7, thou shalt have none other gods before me. Commandment number 1. We're going to get things straight. God's getting things straight. He says, this is my first commandment. You're not going to have any other gods before me. He says, Thou shalt um, not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Essentially, the first five commandments all are dealing with the Lord. How you worship Him, having no other gods before you, you know, keeping the, the, the Sabbath day and not taking the name of the Lord in vain. You know, everything is about, the, is about God, whereas the last five commandments have more to do with your dealings with other, with other people, with other men, with other human beings, and transgressing against them. And um, you flip back, if you would, to 2 Kings, but... That's why in the New Testament you'll see that, um, that there's two great commandments, right? The one is the Lord, love the Lord your God with all the heart, mind, soul, spirit. You know, that is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. And that's why he says, you know, if you could keep these two commandments, that's what the whole law hangs on those two commandments. Because if you think about it, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and spirit, if you love Him that much, that encapsulates not taking the Lord's name in vain, not having any other gods before Him, not making any graven image. You know, all of those things that have to do with serving God is all summed up in just loving Him with all of your heart, mind, soul, and spirit. Whereas the other one, loving your neighbor as yourself, if you care about your neighbor, if you love your neighbor, you're not going to rape them, you're not going to kill them, you're not going to steal from them, right? I mean, this, this makes perfect sense. 
So that's that's the uh, the big connection right between the, the the more general statements in the New Testament and the specific Ten Commandments. But the first and great commandment is to love the Lord your God, right? And in the Ten Commandments, the, the, the first commandments are not having another God before him. And he explains, why? Because God's a jealous God. That's who, you want to know who God is? You know, these days people want to say, you know, jealousy is a bad thing or it's a sin to be jealous. No, it's not. Not if God's jealous. Now, usually people will put that in the context of a relationship, you know, with a husband and wife. Oh, he's a jealous husband. You know what? I'm a jealous husband. And that's actually not a bad thing to be at all. Now, I'm not envious. So we have, people have a tendency to, to confuse jealousy with envy. I'm not envious of, of, you know, another woman or another couple or, or someone, you know, a man that my wife might talk to or something. I'm not envious of them, but I'm jealous. Jealous meaning that my wife is only to be for me and to nobody else. And that's going to make me angry if she were to be making these friendships with other guys and getting close and building bonds with other men when she's supposed to be only kept for me. Yeah, I'm going to be jealous over that. And that's a righteous jealousy. And, and that's the way that God is over his creation and over his people. God made everyone. You know, he's the one that ought to be getting the credit for giving us life, getting the credit for giving us food and drink and the abilities that we have and everything that we have about our life. All the credit should go to God for that. He is our creator. He has spawned us. But when people want to just, just dig up some, some metals out of the ground and put them in a fire and then make some shape with them and say, this is a God, that's insulting. And, and now and when people start to give their affection and their attention that only should be going to God, to some false God or to some devil, it makes God really angry. And you could understand that if your wife were to go off a whoring with, with some other guy, or your husband goes off a whoring with some other woman, that's going to make you angry. Well, think about how God gets angry when you go after some other gods. And it's a, it's a way for us to understand that. But there's nothing wrong with being jealous. There's nothing wrong with being upset if your wife wants to leave you for some other guy. There's nothing wrong with that. You ought to be angry. What you'll also find is that the, the sin of, of idolatry is a major, major sin. There are a lot of things that uh, people can do or have done, and they've received more mercy and more long-suffering from God. But when you, when you reject the Lord, when a people, especially God's people, rejects the Lord and goes after these other gods, that's when he finally just says, that's it, I've had enough. And they, they go into, um, into captivity. And this is what we saw in verses you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 is all about them going after false gods. Look at verse number 13 here in uh, chapter 17 of 2 Kings. The Bible says, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. So he wants them to turn from their evil way. Right? Isn't that what he just said? God's testifying. He sent you prophets. He sent you the seers. He sent you all these people telling you to repent, telling you to turn from your evil way. Repent of your sins. And notice, this is, this is a perfect illustration, a perfect usage of the Bible telling people to turn from their sins. Notice, it does not say turn from your sins to the Savior, because that's the phrase that people want to use today and make it all about salvation. What does he say? He says, turn ye from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes. Because that makes sense. If you're going to turn from doing wickedness and sins, well, you're turning to the law and keeping the commandments and not doing those things anymore and doing what's right by the commandments. That is the repentance that he's asking for here. And he's not asking, he's not, he's not telling them to repent for their souls to be saved and go to heaven. 
This repentance is so that the nation of Israel can continue as a nation and can continue to survive. The salvation of a nation is different than the salvation of an individual soul. In order for, for a nation to continue and to survive, it needs to repent and follow God's commandments. Jonah, chapter number two, you know, explains this. I know most of you here probably are very, very familiar with that passage already. Anyways, I just want to hit on it real quick because it's basically using the same language that we see here in 2 Kings 17, verse 13, in the sense that he's saying to turn from their wickedness, turn from their evil way specifically. I mean, what else... You, know, you, ask, you ask someone who believes you have to turn from all of your sins in order to be saved. And you ask them to show you that in the Bible. Well, where does the Bible say you have to turn from your sins to be saved? The only place you're going to find anything remotely close to that is in reference to a nation being saved, not an individual soul. When, it, when, when the Bible's using the word repent for individual salvation, it never says uh, uh, has a reference to your sins. It never has a reference to your wickedness. It never says, turn from your sins, turn from your wickedness, turn from your evil way in order to receive eternal life. Never. You will not find that one time. What you will find is the more generic term, repent. Or repent and believe the gospel. Because the word repent by itself means has nothing to do inherently with sin. But when you do find, because there are instances like this, turn from your evil ways, yeah, that's in the Bible. Absolutely, it's biblical. Turn from your evil ways. Repent of your sins is biblical when it's not just talking about your soul being saved and going to heaven. Repent of your sins is absolutely biblical. Jonah chapter 2, again, like I mentioned right there at the end of the, the passage. Excuse me, chapter 3. Chapter 3, um, the Bible says in verse 9, well, I'll read in verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Why is he saying this? This was the king of Nineveh making that proclamation. He's saying, let's make a fast. Let's get right with God. Why? Because Jonah went in and preached. He said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He's saying, God's going to destroy this place. He's going to completely wipe you guys out. So, in order to not face that judgment and that wrath of God, what do they do? They turn from their wickedness. They turn from their evil ways. Verse 9 says, Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. It worked. Turning from their wicked way, turning from their evil way, made God change his mind and repent and not destroy Nineveh. The children of Israel were warned, just as Nineveh was warned. He sent his prophet Jonah to warn Nineveh, but they listened. They hearkened. They were not destroyed. Israel, on the other hand, they got more than just one prophet. They have the prophets. They have God's word. They've had so many opportunities given to them didn't do it didn't didn't take heed to god's word didn't turn from their wickedness and as a result they're taken captive look at verse 14 here in second king 17 notwithstanding they would not hear now look at some of the terminology here in verses 14 and 15 because we're going to compare this um actually verses 14 through 17, we're going to compare this with Romans 1. And I know most of you, again, are familiar with Romans 1. Look at the terminology used here in verse 14. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but harden their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire 
and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Now, you should see a lot of similarities. Turn, if you would, to Romans 1, because I want to point this out. We're going to go through this a little bit. There is a firm connection between idolatry, idol worship, these false god worship, and reprobation, and people being rejected. And that, you know, it starts with the idolatry. It starts with, starts with them rejecting God. That's where it starts in the heart, is this rejecting God. We saw that in 2 Kings 17. It says that they rejected God. Right? Let me get the verse here. Verse 14, they would not hear. They hardened their necks. Like the neck of their fathers, they did not believe in the Lord. In verse 15, and they rejected his statutes and his covenant. They rejected him. So, as a result of them rejecting God, they've turned to other gods. They turned to the creature. They turned to the creation. They turned to to these, these idols that are not gods, they became vain, right? We saw that in 2 Kings 17. And started worshiping molten images, calves, whatever. And then they ended up going further down the spiral and doing human sacrifice, murdering their kids, causing their, their sons and daughters to pass through the fire and using witchcraft and divination and enchantments. Well, look at Romans 1. We're going to start reading here in verse number 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, as the children of Israel did, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Just like the children of Israel. The Bible says they became vain and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Just like it says in, in verse 16, in 2 Kings 17, and made molten images, even two calves. which is a four-footed beast, in case you didn't know. Verse 24 in Romans 1, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And it goes on and on talking about the, the sodomites, the homos, that, um, that became that way because of their rejection of God, because of their turning to these idols, and completely then being given up by God but then I want to focus down here at the end of chapter 1 in Romans. The Bible says in verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them and do them. Now, we see the same pattern and the same example happening with the nation of Israel, which they become reprobate. The, chill, the, the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, became reprobate. They were rejected of God. And that's why he allowed them to be taken captive. And that's why they never came back into the land. So the southern kingdom of Judah, we, we see, you know, as you go through the Bible, you have the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and you have the people coming back that were taken captive into Babylon, and then coming back and building the temple again, and, you know, and, and, and doing all this other stuff. That was Judah. Judah did a lot of bad things and they were taken captive, but they were restored. The northern kingdom, the Samaritans, Samaria, they were never restored. Now, 
they had fallen under various rules and you know it wasn't just the Assyrians that were over them but they never were restored to their own status of being a nation again as Israel they were they were completely wiped out and God rejected them and look at we're gonna see that here look at verse number 18 now back in 2 Kings 17 I just wanted to point out those similarities in Romans chapter 1 because it's it's a truth that exists in Scripture and it's not just found in Romans 1. You find this in other places as well. And I also wanted to just point out the, the correlation with the idolatry, right? With the rejecting of God and the idolatry before just completely being rejected. That's the end result is that rejection and then you're given up into all kinds of weird wickedness and sinfulness. And that's where Israel was headed because... The Bible even says that you know, they were doing the things just like the people who were taken out of the land before them, the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites, the Jebusites, you know, all the people that were, that were supposed to be completely destroyed, Israel had gotten down to their level. And when you read the law, you read Leviticus, you read all those things that God says you know, against the sodomy and the bestiality and all kinds of these weird perversions and things that you wouldn't think normally would have had to be written down. And you find out, oh, all the nations that were here before you did all these things. And that's why God didn't want them learning anything about them, didn't want them learning anything about their gods, wanted them completely wiped out, wanted the judgment to come upon them to, to have them be destroyed. And because they weren't, they festered, they became a thorn, they became a cancer to Israel and ended up bringing them down. Uh, let's keep reading here in 2 Kings 17, look at verse number 18. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they made. Look at verse 20. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. That's the result of them rejecting him. He rejected them. And that's what Romans 1 teaches, and that's what we believe here. That when somebody knows God, they glorify Him not as God, they become vain in their, in their own heart, and they want nothing to do with God, they become rejected by God. They start worshiping and serving, creating their own gods, building up their own idols, worshiping whatever they want to worship, after having known the truth and rejecting it, then God rejects them. And from that point, it's too late. Verse 21, for he rent Israel from the house of David and they made Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, king. And Jeroboam drave Israel from following the Lord and made them sin a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them. So, and this is what I was saying at the beginning of the sermon, how Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he really drave the people to sin by building those idols and then they remained with the people all throughout the rest of the, the, their future um, as a nation. Verse 23, until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Cutha and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. So basically Assyria brings all these other heathen people into the land of Israel. He's taken them captive. So what you're getting here now is this, this mingling of, of multiple heathen nations that are coming in to Israel, to Samaria, to this area where, um, where they've been taken captive. I'm going to get into this a little bit more in just a minute. Let's keep reading here, verse 27. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, um, oh, excuse me, I, I jumped ahead. Um, verse 25, And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them because they know not the manner of the God of the land. Now this is really interesting, the insight that they have. And I think this is also just evidence further that, that we are without excuse, as Romans 1 says. 
these things that were happening, they were able to ascribe to a higher power. They're saying that, you know what? This isn't, you know, this isn't just random that all these lions are attacking. And according to the scripture, it wasn't random that the lions were attacking. It was from God. But this is how they want to deal with it. They say, well, they don't know the God of this land because they believe in multiple gods. There's a God of this land and that land and these people and this people. And it's just this polytheistic understanding of God, which is obviously completely false. So here's their solution. It says in verse 27, then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. So he said, Okay, fine. Take one of the priests, you know, send him back over there, and he could teach them all about that God. Right? That's, that's, that was his solution. Verse 28, Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Now, we don't know really how, how well or how true he was teaching the Lord. I mean, it sounds like he might have been teaching the right thing, saying that you need to fear the Lord and try to teach them who the Lord is. But look at verse 29. It says, Howbeit, every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. So basically, if all these lions come in, and he's saying, okay, fine, send a priest back in there. The priest is trying to teach them who the Lord is and they're just, they're making up their own gods anyways. They don't really care. And what they end up doing is mingling these teachings of the Lord in with their other false gods and, you know, kind of merging them together. And, you know, they had been using the high places supposedly to worship the Lord. And now they're like, well, we're just going to, we're just going to change this. We're just going to bring in our own gods and we're still going to use these high places and we'll do some of the things that we've done before. You guys have done, but they basically just, just completely warped and perverted any right view of the Lord. Anyways, verse 30, it says, And the men of Babylon made Succoth Benoth, and the men of uh, Cuth made Nergal, and the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak, and the Sephirvites burnt their children in fire to Adramalek and Anamalek, the gods of Sephirvaim. So these are the different gods that they were creating. They're just making all the, you know, the, these different people all had different gods that they brought into Israel. Verse 32. This is interesting, and you'll notice it goes back and forth between them saying they feared the Lord and they didn't fear the Lord. Yeah. Now look at verse number 32. It says, So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. But look at verse 33, it says, They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. So, did they really fear the Lord? No. What they did was they added the Lord to their collection of gods, to whoever else they served. It's like people today, you know, that want to add Jesus to their own good works in order to be saved. Right? They already have their belief system. It's just, I mean, it's very similar to the guy we were talking to today. He has his belief system, and it's a basic belief system like most people have of just, well, I'm gonna, I need to do what's right. If I do what's wrong, I need to make up for it. I need to make amends for what I've done wrong, and I have to do what's right. And hopefully, you know, at the end of the day, then if I'm a good enough person, I'm going to go to heaven. And then they hear about Jesus. No, 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 you need to be saved. So they're willing to say, oh, okay, yeah, well, we need Jesus in there, but you still have to make right for what you've done wrong and everything. You know, and they just want to add Jesus to say, oh, yeah, well, I've got this fear of God. I've got this fear and, and trust in Jesus, but they're still just trusting in their, in their false religion, in their false ways. This is what was going on here is that they had their false religion. They had their false belief. They had their false gods. And they still believed in that. So obviously the true salvation doesn't come until you say, well, I'm only going to trust in Christ. It's not myself anymore. I need to just completely believe on him. That's the true repentance. That's the true belief that's going to save you is when you say, yeah, my other belief was wrong and I'm believing on this. That's when the true fear comes. That's when your true fear of the Lord is going to come is when you say, yeah, the Lord he is the God. The Lord, He is the God. Remember that with Elijah? And they're doing the test between the, the, the prophets of Baal and, and uh, the Lord. And, they, and they re, you know, people said, yep, He's right. Which means they're wrong. But that's not the case that happened here. 
when they had the lions and stuff coming, they knew there was something wrong, and they said, well, we just need the God of this land, and we'll just incorporate that with all the rest of our gods. So when it says, when the Bible says they feared the Lord, what that means is that they, they had, you know, they, they brought the Lord in, but then he just added them and served their own gods. So in God's eyes, they're not really fearing him because if they actually feared the Lord, he says, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me, right? But they still had a bunch of other gods before him. So they didn't truly fear him, even though in their minds they would say, oh yeah, we fear the Lord, you know, he's our God too. And that's when you're going to get this back and forth between the Bible saying, well, they feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. And then in verse 34, it says, unto this day they do after the former manners, they fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the law and commandment, which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. So even though they're claiming the Lord as one of their gods or as somebody who they serve and who they fear, the Bible's saying they don't really fear the Lord because they're not keeping any of the commandments. They're not actually having respect to the ordinances. They're not paying attention to anything about the Lord that even, you know, that, that came from him. They're just, it's just in name only. Verse 35. With whom the Lord had made a covenant and charged them, saying, Ye shall not fear other gods, nor bow yourselves to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. But the Lord, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt with great power and a stretched out arm, him shall ye fear, and him shall ye worship, and to him shall ye do sacrifice. Now, this is, you know, people want to say, oh, you've got to repent of your sins and be saved. You say, well, what about idolatry? Yeah, you have to repent of idolatry in order to be saved. If you have a false god, right? I'm thinking about this. It's real simple. It's a real basic understanding, but careful not to get caught up in this little trap that people want to set for you. They'll say, well, in order for, say, a Catholic to be saved, they have to repent of being a Catholic, right? You can't be trusting in the Pope. You can't be trusting in Mary. You can't be trusting in any of these other things that are in your works, in your confession to a priest, in your taking of Holy Communion, in your, you know, all the various sacraments. You can't be trusting in those things, which that's what makes you a Catholic, when you're believing in all those things. What the Catholic Church teaches, you, you are that religion when you believe and trust in those things. You cannot be trusting in those things and be saved by believing on Jesus only. You have to repent of that. You have to change and say, I don't trust this stuff anymore. I'm believing on Jesus Christ. That's it. Now they'll say, oh yeah, see, well, they, have, they, they had to repent of their idolatry then, right? Yeah, but it doesn't mean that they have to repent of all of their sins. They're two different things. You say, well, isn't idolatry a sin? Yeah, so then they have to repent of their sins to be saved. <laughs> the only sins they would have to repent of is anything where you're putting another God before God. If you're believing in some other false God, you, you cannot retain that belief and have salvation. So I don't have a problem with people saying, well, you have to turn from that sin. Well, yeah, if that's a problem... If whatever it is that's, that's preventing you from putting all of your faith in Christ, you need to turn from. But it does, it's not this all-encompassing turn from every single one of your sins in order to be saved because, frankly, people aren't trusting in their sins to be saved. If there's a person out there that was trusting in every single one of their sins in order to go to heaven... And they thought they're going to heaven because, man, I've, I've racked up my sin. I've been getting drunk and fornicating. And because I've lived this life and I've done all these sins, I'm going to heaven. That person has to repent of that belief and trusting in their sin. And you could say he has to repent of his sins in order to be saved. And it's still not the works that would save him. It's just that belief. But people don't have that belief. I don't, I've never met one person that thought they were going to heaven because of all the bad things that they've done. So turning from your sins to the Savior is a stupid way to put something that's, that's not a biblical truth found in the, in the Bible. It's, you're turning from your unbelief to belief on Christ. You're turning from belief in a false God, a false religion, a false hope, into the true God, the true religion, the true hope, which is Jesus Christ our Savior. Um, let's see, what verse I leave off on? 
Verse 36, I think I read. Because basically he's explaining how they don't fear the Lord. Even though they're saying they fear the Lord, they don't fear the Lord because they're not, they don't have anything to do with God. They don't care about, any, about the Bible. They don't care about the law of Moses. They don't care about any of the statutes. They're just doing their own thing anyways and they're serving other gods. Verse 37, And the statutes and the ordinances and the law and the commandment which he wrote for you, you shall observe to do forevermore and you shall not fear other gods. And the covenant that I have made with you, you shall not forget. Neither shall you fear other gods. But the Lord your God you shall fear, and he shall deliver you out of the hand of all your enemies. Howbeit, they did not hearken, but they did after their former manner. So these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day. Now, unto this day, meaning the day that this, this book was written, this chapter was written for set in 2 Kings. Obviously, this is recording history, so they're saying it's still like that to this day. And this merging of the Lord with all these false gods and this mingling in with the heathen, this is why the Samaritans were so looked down upon in the New Testament. So when you look at someone who's a Samaritan, literally the Jews, the Jews are the people who were from Judah, from the southern kingdom. They're the, one, the only ones that had any type of integrity in their, you know, physically in their bloodline. When, when they were taken captive, they were still trying to see who remained pure in their captivity. And when they got returned back into their land, it wasn't this total decimation of Judah. They, they were able to return. They were still able to have the priests and the Levites serve the Lord because they didn't completely just intermingle with all of the heathen, even when they were taken captive. And from the, from the time they were taken captive to the time they were returned, they were able to go through the books and still kind of keep their genealogy and, and, um, and do things that way. So, and they also continued to serve the Lord because after they're taken into captivity, they repented and they did turn back to God. Whereas the northern kingdom of Israel, that never happened. It just didn't happen. So as a group of people, they were just, that punished, they were reprobate, they were rejected. And that's the same way then that the Jews looked at them is like they were reprobates. They were just cursed or rejected of God and they, they had no, they didn't have the right religion. And turn if you would now, we're going to go into the New Testament because we're done with 2 Kings 17. But turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 10. And we're going to see some references to the Samaritans in the New Testament. And having this understanding now and knowing what happened to the Samaritans, what happened to the children of Israel, how they got to that point. And then we saw that last verse in 2 Kings 17 that, you know, and they do this unto this day. So they continued just to say that they knew the Lord, but they still had their false gods. They still had everything all screwed up and they had this mingling of religion, mingling of people, and it was just all messed up and, and, and nothing good or righteous at all about, about their religion. So, um, you know, basically their religion was a joke because everything about the people was mingled with the heathen. They rejected their own religion when they had the truth, when they had the prophets coming to them, they rejected it. And then they were taken captive and physically were mingled with the people of the land and also their, their religions were mingled together also. And um, while they claimed to serve the Lord, it was not the religion that the Lord gave them. So if you look at Matthew chapter 10, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So at this point, even Jesus isn't considering the Samaritans the lost sheep of the house of Israel because they've just been completely rejected from being a people in, even in God's eyes and in Jesus' eyes. And we're going to see some more. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. So as Matthew chapter 10. Go to Luke chapter 10. And basically, he's, he's equating the Samaritans with the Gentiles. Right? When Jesus was sent, he came unto his own and he, and, and he preached unto his own. And yeah, there were was, there was situations here and there and he dealt with some individuals, but he, he, they weren't being sent to the Gentiles until after his death, burial, and resurrection. And then he sent them out into the whole world to preach the gospel to every creature. But when he first came, he came to the Jews. He came to those of Judea. He came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
that would still even be considered a sheep. Look at Luke chapter 10, verse number 30. This is the story of the good Samaritan. And this is one of the reasons why this passage has an impact that Jesus is teaching this and he's using a Samaritan is because of this history and because of how, who the Samaritans were and how they were looked down upon as a people because they've been mingled and everything and got all screwed up. So in his example, look at verse 30, uh, keeping this, this understanding in mind when he tells a parable, Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So now, who better to run into than a priest, right? This guy just got beat up. He's half dead. He's laying in the ditch. He just got robbed. He can't help himself at all. And a priest comes along. Well, well the priests were revered. They were looked up to. Right? I mean, these were, these were supposedly great men of God. They're the priests. They're serving the Lord. And he just crosses on the other side of the street, does his own thing, doesn't have time to deal with it, whatever. Verse 32, and likewise a Levite. Now again, the Levites were supposed to have the service of the Lord. They're supposed to be, you know, doing the work of God. Not the same as the priest's office, but they're still Levite. They're still serving God. And likewise, the Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said, you know, take care of him. Whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Uh, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Now, obviously, I'm not going to get into all the, 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 the meaning, underlying meaning of this passage. I mean, it's a great parable. And he's demonstrating, obviously, that like, they shouldn't have this necessarily this view of the Samaritans because, you know, this Samaritan who you look down upon was able to do this good thing, whereas the, the priests and the Levites who you're, you were respecting, you know, they're not always going to do the right thing or whatever. So, so, you know, there's a lot more to that. But, but to understand this parable a little bit more fully is just understanding the way that it, the, the reasons why the Samaritans were looked down upon so much and how much of an impact this has. Well, this was a Samaritan. This was supposedly like a dog. And when you read the book of Acts, it's evident that the Jews look down on like every other people, the Gentiles, the Samaritans. You know, they had this really lofty view of themselves. And I would say a very racist view because they had this, this belief of being God's chosen people and everyone else was like a dog. I mean, even to this day, there's many Jews that have the, you know, this, this belief of the goyim and how they're just here to serve you and that they're just like animals or just barely above an animal. You know, and they have this view of people. That's the same view that many Jews had back in Jesus' day. And Jesus had to rebuke them and, and show them these things and give them these parables. And, you know, even the, the, the apostles needed that type of guidance and, you know, Peter being given the vision and stuff. And, you know, they weren't even supposed to eat with the Gentiles, which that wasn't found in the Bible, but that's some extra biblical law that they had among their own people. So turn if you would to John chapter four, we'll see this here also. And it's the last place we'll turn. We're almost done. Don't worry, I'm not going to uh, go for like an hour and 20 minutes tonight or anything like that. But in John chapter four, we see the parable of the woman at the well. And guess who, guess who the woman at the well is? She's a Samaritan. So we see one more example here of someone from Samaria. And again, the, the kind of the view that, that is given of Samaritans in the New Testament and the reason why is because of what we saw here in 2 Kings 17, of them being taken captive, getting mingled, and never coming back and basically being a reprobate people. Uh, verse number five in John chapter four, the Bible says, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. I mean, it says it right there, black and white in the Bible. 
This is the attitude that the Jews and the Samaritans had. You know, and you know what she said? She didn't say the Samaritans have no dealing with the Jews. She said the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans because that's the way that they viewed them because they really lifted themselves up of, of, of these views of, these, of this you know, reprobate people of Samaritans. Verse number 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou th that living water? Now, I just want to make one more point real quick because of you know, some of the things that I've already mentioned tonight about Jesus you know, not going into the Samaritans. Well, he's talking to a Samaritan woman right here, and he's given her the gospel, and she ends up getting saved. So Jesus does not have this racist perspective, perspective, but the reason why he didn't go into those other cities is because he was still fulfilling prophecy. He had to go unto his own and his own receive him not. He was going to the lost sheep of the children of Israel first. That was the whole plan. But the plan the whole time was still to send people out. It's not that he didn't care about the Samaritans. It's not that he was just damning them all to hell. He does care about them, especially individually. But he had a plan and an order in the way that he had to come was fulfilling scripture and everything else. So he came unto his own, his own received him not. And then basically that's when the Jews become reprobate as a people, right? Just as Israel had before that. And it doesn't mean that every single Jew is unsaved. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about his people. Because Jesus was the last, his son came unto the people and then they rejected him. He said, fine, we're done using you. And he's taken away the kingdom from them. He's given it unto a people who's going to bear the fruits thereof. So that's, and, and that's the way that God uh, continues to work. So they, they've been rejected from serving him. Now, if they turn back to the Lord, it doesn't mean they can't be used of him again. But, um, you know, he had given up on them. So um, here, this is a Samaritan. It's not like he gave up on every single Samaritan from, for salvation. No, he rejected them as a people, as a group to... to um, to do his will here. So, um, so he's answering her, verse 12, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? So, you know, the people of Samaria, they're still physical descendants of Jacob. Their religion got all screwed up because they got mingled in with all the heathen and, and all their weird pagan practices and everything else. But they still can have this claim and say, well, well, Jacob's our father. You know, are you greater than Jacob? And then verse 13 says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well, a, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidst thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So now she's bringing up some of the differences between the Samaritans and the Jews. Or she said, well, well, our father, you know, we worshipped in this mountain. Yeah, probably in the high places of that mountain. Right? And she still cling to that old religion where they're worshipping in the high places. And you say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. And that is something, right, that the people of Judah had. They had the house of the Lord. This is, you know, God said he ought to be worshipped in the place where he puts his name. And then Jesus answers her. He answers this, this, this uh, statement you know, that she makes here about, uh, about where to worship and stuff and the right religion. Verse 21, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. He said, you don't even know what you worship. You don't even know God. You don't even know the right religion. He says, we know that what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. So the Jews have the right religion. They have the right God. They have the right place. Now, the Jews, let me rephrase that. You say They have the right religion, meaning the right God. Because by and large, the Jews, the Judaism religion that they were practicing was not right. That was not correct. But... God was using the Jews to still um, dispense with God's law and, God, you know, and God's word 
and the laws of Moses and everything else that went along with it. So um, that's what he's saying, salvation is of the Jews because that's still where the truth was from anywhere in the world. It was still with, you know, being held with the Jews. It was still being used of the Jews here. Verse 23, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Um, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And he reveals himself as being the Christ. Verse 27, And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, What seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? Now why did they marvel? Because she's a Samaritan. So they came and they were amazed. They're like, wow, why is Jesus talking to this Samaritan woman? He was giving her the gospel. He was revealing unto her that he was the Christ because he wanted her to be saved. Just like you want, you know, Jesus wants everyone to be saved. Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But um, anyhow, I just wanted to go through some of those passages in the New Testament to shed some light on who the Samaritans were and, and, and why they are treated the way they are in the New Testament, especially among those, those famous passages, and to give you a little bit more insight um, and hopefully a better understanding of those passages, knowing the history of the Samaritans and Samaria and Israel and how they rejected God and were taken captive and everything. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all these, uh, these great truths of the Bible. I ask for you to open up our understanding, help us to... Just know more about your word. Help us to study, to show ourselves approved unto you and that you would just open up more um, knowledge and understanding of your words and help us to, to just gain some more insights and, and more applications that we can make um, into our own lives by knowing these truths. And uh, Lord, we just ask that you would continue to open up your words to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.